The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book 3 The Monster in the Hollows. Chapter 32 A Discovery in the Vale. If Janner wasn't sure about telling his mother about their conversation with the Lumpia Ground Witch, one look at her told him he should wait. For the first time in a long time, Naya was in a fine mood. She greeted the children with a smile that made her seem ten years younger, and then she drove the carriage past the keep and pointed at Van Rona in the distant harbor. The clouds had broken open to reveal blue sky, and sunlight painted the hills a vibrant green in contrast to the blaze of color in every treetop. Smoke rose from chimneys, ships rocked in the quay, and the sun was warm in the chilly air. This city has always been so beautiful in the fall, Naya said, taking a deep breath. I never thought you'd see it, you know. The maker is full of surprises. With a sigh, she shook the reins and the horses heaved on. When they got home, Rudrick was waiting. He sat on a huge horse, hands folded on the saddle horn. Next to him stood another horse, saddled and stomping the grass. Bonifer, Oscar, and Poto reclined in garden chairs, dozing in the sunlight with pipes dangling from their mouths. Janner supposed there was no plans to visit the library that day. Oscar and Bonifer had been working for two days without a break, and the weather seemed to have lulled them to sleep. Ready when you are, Rudrick said as to Naya without even a glance at the children. He grinned at her in a way that made Janner feel a little embarrassed, though Naya didn't seem to mind at all. She let out what Janner would have called a giggle if he didn't know any better. Naya Wingfeather didn't giggle. But without a word to the children, she mounted the horse and the two of them trotted down the hill. Lily led her puppy inside, cooing to it about finding some food and asking what its name should be. She left Janner and Kalmar on the front lawn. Come on! Kalmar said, dropping his pack at the front steps. I want to show you something. He didn't wait for an answer. Janner tossed his bag aside and ran around the house to catch up. In a flash, he went from mulling over Grigory Bunge, Rudrick, Olympia, and a host of other worries to thinking of nothing at all but the bright, wet grass and the wide openness of the afternoon. Kalmar jogged across the back lawn, past the barn and the goat pen, to the open prairie beyond. Fields and hills and wooded va valleys spread out as far as Janner could see. Kalmar turned to be sure Janner was following, then whooped and sped off. Janner couldn't catch him, but he could see him up ahead, always over the next rise or around the next bend, pausing now and then to make sure Janner was coming. Janner vaulted a wooden fence, surprising a family of wild goats and sending them running. He followed Kalmar's trail down a wagon path overgrown with prairie grass, passing a ramshackle skeleton of a barn where a rooster perched on a rafter. Just after the old barn, the land dropped away and Kalmar disappeared from view. When Janner got to the last spot he'd seen his brother, he skidded to a stop, lungs aflame. The field fell away down a grassy slope so steep it might have been a gully. Janner reminded himself that there were no Gargan rock roaches in the Green Hollows, according to Pembroke's Creaturepedia, anyway. At the bottom of the hill was a pond with green algae at the edges, surrounded by weeds, but no Kalmar. Cal! Janner called between breaths. I don't know you. I know you're down there! Janner half expected to see him come up from under the water, soaked and covered in green goo. He scanned the veil again, more slowly this time. He was certain Kalmar had come this way, but other than the pond, there was nowhere he could hide. Cal, where are you? Right here, said Kalmar. He sounded close, but his voice was muted. Janner edged his way down the slope, bracing himself for Kalmar to jump out and scare him. Getting closer, Kalmar said, taunting him. Janner made his way to the pond, sliding on his rump in the steepest places. He turned in a slow circle until he was facing the way he had just come. Then he saw it. At the bottom of the hill, overgrown with weeds, was the mouth of a cave from which a trickle of water ran, feeding the pond. The hillside sloped out over the entrance so that it was hidden from anyone not standing at the bottom. Kalmar's head poked out among the weeds. Janner grinned. 
how did you find this? What do you think I did while you were at the library? Stick my nose in some book? Kalmar waved Janner over. I found it yesterday. I wanted to show you. Janner crawled through the soggy weeds and ducked under the grassy overhang. He smelled wet earth and a sharp, foul odor like mildew or mold, but he couldn't see more than a few feet in the gloom. He waited for his eyes to adjust and soon saw that, a little way ahead, the ceiling rose enough so that he could stand. Janner wiped his muddy hands on his pants and looked around. How far back does it go? he whispered. Why are you whispering? Kalmar whispered back. I don't know, Janner whispered, and they laughed. The brothers crept deeper into the cave, sidestepping the little creek until the green tint of light at the entrance seemed uncomfortably far away. I wish we had a lantern or something, Janner said. I can't see a thing. I can see fine. It goes several more steps back, then turns a corner. I'm going to check it out. Wait, Janner said, not because he was worried, but because he wanted to go with him. But it was too late. Janner could hear Kalmar scraping his way ahead, calling back from time to time about how high the ceiling was or about a pincher fish swimming through a puddle. Janner didn't want to be a fang, but he certainly wouldn't mind being able to see in the dark. He leaned against the damp wall and waited for several long minutes. He didn't mind the dark so much, but he didn't like being alone. Kalmar had gone out of earshot and the stench and the dripping silence were unnerving. Dead end, said Kalmar right in front of Janner's face. Janner jerked with surprise. His foot slipped, and he landed on his rump in the puddle. Kalmar doubled over with laughter, and then Janner laughed too, and the cave echoed with it, perhaps for the first time since Air We Are was made. When they crawled out, the sun was sinking in the west, casting a shadow on the little valley. They were wet and muddy, but neither boy noticed. Not, nor would they have cared if they did. They had gone caving, which was far better than cleanliness. At the top of the hill, the sun smiled on them and dried their clothes on the walk home. They talked about little things, like their favorite meals, how much they wished they knew dog speak, and techniques they had learned that day in the Durgan Guild. By the time they arrived at Chimney Hill, Janner forgot that his brother was a gray fang. Kalmar was just Kalmar. When they walked inside, caked with dried mud, Naya gasped and shooed them upstairs to clean up and change. She didn't ask where they'd been or how they'd gotten dirty and Janner was pretty sure he knew why. All her attention was on the big man visiting with Poto at the hearth. Rudrick stayed for dinner. Janner went to bed that night with a lightness in his heart that battled with his frustration at his brother. He heard Lily in the next room singing her puppy to sleep. Kalmar must have heard it too, because he was snoring in seconds. Janner's mind was working too fast for him to sleep, so he got out of bed. He found the matches, lit the lantern, and fished his journal and quill out of his pack. He hadn't written in a long time, and he had a lot of things to think about. Sitting at the desk and writing was the best way he knew to sort them out. He still wasn't sure what to make of his conversation with Kalmar the night before about his transformation in the food dungeons. He knew Kalmar had an impulsive nature. He knew he was prone to rash decisions, which were also typically wrong decisions. But there was a difference between wrong and evil, wasn't there? Kalmar hadn't just made an innocent judgment, or an incorrect judgment. He had willed something very dark into his heart. He had meant to do it. When Kalmar sang the song in the Foob Dungeon, he had not just given up on the possibility of rescue, but he had chosen to open a deep part of his heart to a powerful blackness. Janner had told Cal that Esben's blood was stronger than that blackness, but now he wasn't sure. Was that still true, even if Kalmar had invited the blackness in? Janner also wondered about the song the stonekeeper made Kalmar sing. He had seen power before in music, in Lily's power to still the dragons, to speak to the dogs and the houndry, and strangest of all, to awaken whatever magic bond the wingfeather children together, bound the wingfeather children together, and allowed Janner to hear the strange voices. It made sense, then, that there could also be music that carried dark power, music dark enough and powerful enough to change a boy into a fang. If that was true, it meant that every fang had been a regular person once, and those people hadn't had it forced upon them either. They had chosen it. 
Kalmar said that the stonekeeper told him it only worked if he wanted it to. So the fangs were people who had welcomed it in, embraced the transformation, put on lizard skin or wolf's fur like a costume they could never remove. Then what about Uncle Artham? Janner thought back to when he had first met him as Pete the Sock Man. Pete was as crazy as a loon bird and wore socks up to his elbows to hide the talons his hands had become. If the transformation came because of Artham's willingness, not just to sing some black music, but to mean it, then he understood his uncle's insanity a little better. But only Pete's hands had changed. Did that mean he had only started to sing the song? Had he changed his mind? That didn't seem bad enough to make him go crazy over it. There must have been something else, some deeper wound that drove the mighty Artham P. Wingfeather mad. Maybe it was the thing he feared in the Blackwood. If it was a forest populated with creatures as scary as the thing that lurched through the yard that night, Janner could see how someone would go insane if they were lost in it, wandering about in the dark with all those lumpy, hungering monsters. Still, he couldn't make sense of the Artham he knew now, the Artham with the span of bright wings. For some reason, when he rescued Kalmar in the food dungeon, he had grown into something more and not less. That meant that the power Nag the Nameless and his stonekeeper had unlocked in the music could do more than just warp and deform. It could do more than destroy. It could change something twisted into a flourish. It could make what was bent and make it beautiful. It could heal. Janner turned from the desk and looked at his brother, snoring in his bed, sleeping peacefully for a few hours before he had to face another day of stares and mockery and cruelty. Janner was humbled and saddened all at once. Whatever wounds his heart bore because of Kalmar's betrayal, whatever wounds his flesh bore because of Kalmar's claws and teeth, Whatever loss of freedom he bore as the throne warden, they were dwarfed by his brother's burden. Kalmar's was the heavier load by far, one that he clung to even as it hurt him. Shame. Janner heard Artham in his mind, saw him as he leapt onto the rock roach den, one word pulsing in him like a beating heart. Protect, protect, protect. And what had Janner done? Complain, complain. Complain. Janner gritted his teeth. He didn't want that to be his story. He didn't want that to be the word that defined him. He wanted to shake free of it and put on something better. He didn't know how, but he had to find a way to stop the trouble at school. He was a throne warden, and he had to stop Grigory Bunge and anyone else who threatened the High King of Anaria. Janner woke sometime in the night with his head on the desk and his quill in his hand. His heart was heavy as a stone, because a solution to their problem at the Guildling Hall had come to him. He could see no other way. He blew out the lantern and crawled under his covers without noticing that Kalmar's bed was empty. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book 3 The Monster in the Hollows Chapter 33, A Reckoning for the Bunge The next morning, Kalmar slept through breakfast. Naya sent Janner upstairs to fetch him, and after much shaking and pinching, he finally woke and stumbled out to the carriage with his pack. Lily had named her dog Baxter, after a boy in one of her favorite stories, and she rode in the carriage with the puppy in her lap. All the way to the school, she spoke to it, and Baxter seemed to understand her. She tried to teach Janner how to dog speak the command, sit on my lap, but no matter how he clicked his tongue, the dog ignored him. Cal, you want to try? Lily asked. I bet you'd be great at it. What's that supposed to mean? Kalmar snapped. Just that you've always been good with dogs. I don't know. Cal, don't talk to your sister like that, Naya said from the front. You know she wouldn't make fun of you. Sorry. Kalmar slouched in his seat and turned to face the road. Janner knew his brother was hardening himself for the day ahead. They hadn't even arrived at the Guildling Hall, and already the struggle had begun. When they encountered carriage traffic, and with all the stares of children and adults alike, Kalmar hunched even lower, as if he could fold himself and become invisible. Janner knew Cal's restraint couldn't last. 
anyone would break if a whole school of children pushed hard enough, and Kalmar wasn't just anyone. His fangness made him strong enough to outmatch any bully at the school, any guildmaster too, perhaps, which would make it even harder not to fight back. Janner knew what he had to do, and he dreaded it. He wasn't impulsive like Kalmar. He had to think things over. The problem was, thinking was exactly the wrong thing to do in this case. If he thought too much, he'd never follow through. Out you go, Naya said as she rounded the statue. Janner hopped to the ground just after Kalmar, and the brothers lifted Lily and Baxter over a puddle and handed her the crutch. See you this afternoon, children. Remember who you are. As soon as she was gone, Janner heard Grigory Bunge's laughter. Oi, said Grigory. Good morning to the nursemaid, the dog boy, and the girl who can't walk. Lightning flashed and a chilly rain fell. Janner's heart sank. He had hoped there would be at least a little time before he had to act, but Bunge was waiting. Janner looked around for help, but Guild Madam Groundwitch was nowhere to be seen. The parents driving carriages through the courtyard looked everywhere but at the wing feathers. I'm talking to you, Fang, Grigory said. Janner sighed and dropped his pack. The time had come. Before Grigory knew what hit him, Janner spun around, roared something unintelligible, and dove headfirst into the boy. It was like diving into a wall, but Janner heard the air wheeze from Grigory's lungs, and the two of them toppled over. Janner swung his fist wildly, grunting like an animal. He took several punches, which he hardly felt, and threw several back. He prayed for strength, even in his rage, for he swung not in his own defense, but his brothers, his sisters, and his mothers. He fought not over a petty insult, but for their honor and even their freedom. Grigory Bunge, whether he knew it or not, was doing more than bullying. He was waging war with the jewels of Anaria, children of the king. Janner knew nothing but a white-hot anger for a while, and then he felt Kalmar's claws dragging him off the bewildered bully. A crowd had gathered and stood in the rain, watching Janner writhe in his brother's grip. Leave my brother alone! Janner shouted. I don't want to fight you, but I will if I have to, Grigory Bunge. And that goes for the rest of you! Janner hurled his defiance at every guildling in the courtyard. He shook loose of Kalmar's grip and strode forward, beating his chest with a fist and shouting, I'm the throne warden of Anaria, and Kalmar is my charge. Do you hear me? I've battled fangs and trolls. I've walked the stony mountains and sailed the dark sea. I've stood in Jurgen's shadow and looked the dragon in the eye. Lightning scraped the clouds as Janner stood in the rain and screamed. He flung a finger in Grigory's terrified face. The Maker has brought us safely this far, Grigory Bunge, and I will fear no guildling of the Green Hollows. If you insult the High King or the Slog Maiden, you will reckon with the Throne Warden. Do you understand? Grigory glanced at the other children. Janner leapt forward and put his face in Grigory's. He knew that the boy could beat him into the mud if he had a chance to gather his wits, so Janner's only weapon was his madness. Do you understand? Janner said through clenched teeth. Finally, Grigory nodded and stammered, y Yes! Yes, Throne Warden Wingfeather, Janner growled. Yes, Throne Warden w Wingfeather. Janner pushed away from Grigory and walked back to Kalmar and Lily. His knees trembled so violently that it took all his willpower to stand. Lily's face came to view, and she spoke words that were like cool water poured through his veins. The horn from school blew, and in a rush, Janner felt the rain again, heard the chatter of students shuffling inside and realized his nose was bleeding. Grigory was gone. Janner didn't know why, but he felt like crying. He wiped his nose with his sleeve and tried to avoid looking at his siblings. But he couldn't because Kalmar and Lily were standing right in front of him, heedless of the rain. Lily held one of Janner's hands. Kalmar and Lily hugged him, and he could hold in his tears no longer. After that, things seemed to go better. When word spread about the fight with Grigory, the guildling's attitude changed toward the wing feathers. Where before they had stared and muttered, now they ignored the three of them completely. It would have been nice to be treated with kindness, but indifference in this case was just as good. The bond between Lily, Kalmar, and Janner strengthened. The more they leaned on one another, the stronger they were. 
The lecture that morning was as boring as the one the day before, but Janner passed the time writing in his journal. In PT was a giant game of tackle ball, an activity that always improved his mood, however foul he felt. Lily ran Houndricks up and down the field while Janner and Kalmar played. The jewels of Anaria sat on the floor again at lunch, but for the first time, the room didn't go silent when they entered. At the Durgan Guild, things went even better. It was a smaller class, and the brothers were quick learners. Guildmaster Clout was hard but fair, and soon the other guildlings treated them with respect. They still seemed uncomfortable when they wrestled Kalmar, but none of them liked being outmatched, so they learned to get over it if they wanted to win. That was the way of things for weeks. A lumpy ground witch kept watch over the wing feathers. Janner spotted her from time to time, peeking in at lectures and glancing at him in the hall while she spoke with other guildmasters in hushed tones. Sometimes she winked or wagged her whiskers at him. As for Grigory Bunge, he avoided the wing feathers, and Janner sometimes went days without seeing him. When he happened to pass him at PT or in the mess hall, Grigory gave him a stiff nod and moved away. Most days, Janner visited the library after school and sat in the corner, reading or working at his thags, while Bonifer and Oscar translated line after tedious line from the first book. Janner asked them about their progress, but he was far more interested in books with, like Terrible Tales from the Woes of Shreve and Omer and the Moon Dragon, both of which were recommended by Owen, the archival apprentice, and both of which Janner devoured in a matter of days. After several weeks in the Green Hollows, the Wingfeather family at last began to settle into a routine. It had been months since their lives in Glipwood had turned upside down, so the change was welcome. Naya and Freva prepared a scrumptious breakfast each morning. Poto took a morning nap. Naya drove the children to school and often brought, bought vegetables at the harborside market while she was out. One day she returned with the news that the Enramir's mast had been repaired and the Chimerans were sailing back to Scree. Bonifer and Oscar spent hours upon hours in the library, and Rudrick found reasons to come to Chimney Hill as often as possible. It wasn't long before they all realized the Keeper of the Hollows had his eye on Naya Wingfeather. It took Janner a while, but he eventually warmed up to the idea of his mother courting. He wasn't sure how all the politics worked. Would Naya still be the Queen of Anaria if she married the Keeper of the Hollows? Was she the queen anyway, since Kalmar was technically the king now? But he liked Rudrick, and he believed that even his father would want Naya to find a good husband. With each passing day, Chimney Hill felt more like the home Janner had always wanted. He thought of Anaria less and less, partly because of Naya's strong ties to the Hollows, and partly because, well, Anaria was a smoldering ruin. On certain days, when the wind was right, he could smell it. He had assumed it was some neighbor's chimney until Rudrick told him otherwise. He said the scent was different, sharper, as if the island itself, not just the trees, were burning. Soon, Janner could tell the difference. It troubled him when he smelled it, but the wind came from the south seldom enough that it was rare for him to think of Anaria at all. The weather turned cold, and Janner at last allowed himself to believe that he had found a home where he was safe from green fangs and gray fangs and toothy cows and abominables and anything else with fangs. That was when the first of the hog pigs went missing, and rumors passed from home to home that another cloven was loose in the city. <laughs>